Okay, well, um, I'm, uh, I was asked by, uh, by Dean uh, Simmons to, um, uh, to, to start this off, and it's so great to see everybody here. Uh, uh, my, my name is Mark Goodell, and it's very, very nice to be here at this book launch uh, for uh, two of my recent uh, books and uh, Sarah Cobb's uh, recent book. And, and I believe this is the first book launch of the year. From what I understand, there will be a whole series of, of book launches. Um, and, and I just want to say thanks, and I think I speak for uh, Sarah as well, thanks to Molly Tepper and, and Cassie for, and, and whoever else was part of this, uh, for organizing this event. Um, this is really a celebration of scholarship uh, here at SCAR, and I think it's also a celebration of the breadth of scholarship. Um, and in that sense, it's really a focus on the future. Um, the, uh, the, the books that we're going to be talking about uh, briefly tonight that we're here to, that we're here to, to, to discuss, uh, I think, um, represent the big tent conception of the field. And I also want to make sure, even though I'm starting off, that I keep my remarks relatively brief uh, to leave ample room for Sarah Cobb's absolutely brilliant uh, first book, uh, Speaking of Violence, which, which I would like to see as the showcase here, to, here tonight. Um, so Cassie asked, asked us, I guess, to say a few things about our, our books. So we're talking about our own work here, which is always a little bit, a little bit awkward, um, and I uh, uh, had to go back and, and look through the uh, <laughs> look, look through the, the, the work to, uh, to to think about what I might say about this. Um, so uh, the two books that that were, that, that, that I recently um, that, that I recently published are edited volumes. So these are not my my sole authored books. So I'm the editor and co-editor of these of these volumes. Um, and as you might know, I uh, I'm involved in quite a few edited volume projects. Um, I've also published two uh, sole authored books. Uh, and those also are, so, you know, so author manuscripts serve a, an important function. But let me say something about, you know, people ask me, you know, why, how, how do you get involved with so many of these edited book projects? And part of it is that, I, mean, I look at this as a service, a service to not the discipline or the field, but these are multiple interdisciplinary projects. And, you know, if done right, and I talk to students and colleagues about this a lot, if done right, an edited volume can make it a very important set of contributions uh, to, to discussions and to, and to debates. You know, um, you know, at the very least, it, it takes the burden off of one person to make those contributions, and so you can bring together a variety of voices. And I think for somebody who's working in this interdisciplinary field of conflict uh, analysis and resolution, this kind of collaborative uh, work is, is, is crucially important. And so that's one of the reasons why I enjoy, I enjoy being part of, it, part of this. And I would say that in terms of looking back over, over these uh, various books that I've published since I've come to SCAR, uh, a few of them have, have really attained, reached that, that level of, uh, of, of contribution, and some of them haven't. Um, but let me say something about, about these two volumes, and, and again, very briefly, and try to uh, draw out, I guess, the, um, some of the relevance for, for, for the field of, of conflict analysis and resolution. The first uh, book I want to say something about is uh, Neoliberalism Interrupted. Um, yes, so, so this is... This is a play, of course, on the movie Girl Interrupted, uh, but, but um, if you know that. But, so this is a, uh, an edited volume, an interdisciplinary edited volume, anthropologists, sociologists, uh, uh, philosophers, and others. And it's a series of case studies which are based in Latin America, uh, which are looking at, uh, empirically, uh, looking at the various challenges to neoliberal hegemony. Uh, on the one hand, and on the other hand, various forms of resistance to these challenges, uh, to neoliberal uh, hegemony. And I thought it was very interesting that this morning at our faculty meeting, we had a discussion <laughs> of neoliberalism uh, in relation to yet another book, which is being uh, published by an SCAR faculty member, Thomas Flores, who has uh, a set of research interests around neoliberalism that are, that are different. But, um, uh, but again, uh, another, another, a topic which Apparently, since I and others are in SCAR are, are looking at it, have relevance to the, to the field. Um, and one of the points that was, wait, was, that was made this morning um, at the faculty board, which I thought was very interesting, is that while we look at neoliberalism as, as scholars, as critics, and again, thinking empirically and then as, as theorists uh, thinking normatively about these, about these case studies, it is also true that our field, the field of conflict analysis and resolution, is bound up with processes, processes of neoliberal neoliberalism, if not neoliberal uh, hegemony to a certain extent. 
um, to the extent to which we, can, we might want to include within this neoliberal package processes of good governance, processes of post-conflict reconstruction, uh, processes of development, rule of law. a rule of law. Then we have our field, which is bound up and, and, and um, part of, these, uh, of this process in, in very interesting ways. Um, and that's not to say anything about our field, but what it is to say, I think, it, uh, about is the, the extent to which, especially after the Cold War, neoliberalism, quote, you know, broadly defined, has really become the only legitimate um, secular game in town. Uh, and so I think that's, again, thinking about how our field might um, uh, interrogate some of the interesting implications of neoliberalism. The fact that our field is practically bound up with it, I think, uh, provide some interesting openings for, for that. Um, but coming back to the book, so why Latin America? Uh, I've been doing research in Latin America uh, since the mid-1990s, uh, mostly in South America. And the reason is, is because, as many of you, many of you might know, uh, from the mid to late 1980s, Latin America was a case study, it was an experiment for something which came to be known as the Washington Consensus. And this was a time in which the nations of, of, of Latin America and elsewhere, but Latin America in particular, were suffering under massive amounts of debt, uh, and had just mo many many countries in Latin America had just come off periods of authoritarianism, dictatorship, and were in the process of democratization. And so the World Bank and the International Monetary Fund got aggressively involved in Latin America to shape uh, state making and to shape policy. Of course, this harkens back to a much longer history of colonialism, in which that the area we call Latin America has always been of, of, of special interest to, to the United States for di in, in different kinds of ways and different kinds of periods. And so there was something called this Washington Consensus. There was a certain pattern throughout Latin America uh, in which a, a relatively rigid model of neoliberal development was, it was, was uh, implemented throughout the sort of vast diversity of, of Latin America, um, spearheaded by uh, people like Jeff Jeffrey Sachs, uh, and others who were consultants to various countries. Um, and, uh, and so there was a kind of set of very specific set of prescriptions around privatization, around the dealing, around uh, relationships with public unions, around uh, public debt, which created a pattern. Mm -hmm. And so in recent years, and especially in the post-Cold War, uh, over the last 15 or 20 years, there have been challenges to this neo neoliberal hegemony. Uh, and so again, Latin America makes a, an interesting case a case uh, study. And so what we found in the book, in terms of at an empirical level, is we really had, we have really two poles in Latin America um, in terms of this question of neoliberalism. On the one hand, we have cases of radical experimentation, radical challenges to uh, neoliberalism. Uh, and I'm thinking, of course, of Bolivia. It just so happens the place I know, I know best, in which we have what people have called a post-neoliberal social experiment, social and democratic and, and uh, economic experiment. And on the other pole, we have <coughs> radical re-entrenchment, re radical resistance uh, to, uh, to the challenges, and the emergence of what we call in our book authoritarian neoliberalism. And there are various countries which, which reflect that. And in fact, in terms of uh, in absolute numbers, the resistance, the authoritarian um, response to challenges to neoliberalism are the majority in Latin America, it's a relatively small number of countries. Um, and our methodology in the book is, um, in terms of what, what we were doing, is we were looking at um, not, again, I'm not a political scientist, I'm an anthropologist, a social theorist, and other kinds of things, uh, but we were looking really, we were looking at these questions through small scale ex uh, experiences of people, activists, social leaders, rebels, intellectuals, and others, to try to sort of get an emic or an insider's perspective on what uh, the current state of neoliberalism looks like uh, in, in Latin America. And we have various findings, uh, but I want to just mention one, which has to do with the role and ideology of the state. So what is the role of the state in 2013 in Latin America, and maybe more generally, in an era of what uh, James Ferguson called the neoliberal world order, and yet also in an era of, of dramatic challenges to neoliberalism? And it was somewhat, somewhat awkward for me, we arrived at a, this is based on our empirical research, we found, um, uh, we arrived at a typology. Yeah, a typology of different <laughs> kinds of states uh, in Latin America in, in reference to neoliberalism. The first is what we call the classic neoliberal states. Um, and these are states uh, in which um, challenges to the neoliberal project of the 1980s never merged to any significant degree, arguably Argentina and uh, arguably Mexico, 
um, and, and other countries. Uh, and here we have, by, by, the, by classic, what we mean is that forms of governance, or what Foucault called governmentality, the way in which identity, the way in which social relations are managed, uh, you know, have, have developed, have matured to a very high degree. Um, a second category, a second type of state, is what we call democratic authoritarian uh, neoliberal states. And these are states in which there's a long history of centralism in Latin America. States in which there is a urge toward democratic uh, consolidation, um, but th the state plays an, uh, a role different than in the classic neoliberal model in the sense of, instead of privatizing control, you know, employing these Foucauldian uh, forms of, of governmentality and, and governance, the state centralizes those functions and looks a lot like the state 20 years ago, 30 years ago, 40 years ago, but within a neoliberal, uh, a neoliberal primarily economic model. Uh, and then finally, uh, the example, final type of example. What's that? Example. Uh, we would say Paraguay uh, and some of the Central American countries look, uh, typify this author democratic authoritarianism. And then finally, maybe for me most interesting, um, the final type is what we call the ethical neoliberal, and then in, we have in parentheses post so again, meaning that there are some ethical post-neoliberal states and some ethical neoliberal states. And what's most interesting for me, of course, is the ethical post-neoliberal state. And of course, we know what ex the example is, which is Bolivia. <laughs> and here we have states which are formally, uh, officially, uh, uh, in, a, in a process of challenging and offering a formal alternative to a ne neoliberal model across these different indicators. What's interesting is that the, that the articulation of, this, of these alternatives is not primarily along political or economic lines, but are along what we've found to be ethical lines. So for example, in Bolivia, the, the, the explanation for why neoliberalism was bad, or why an alternative should be developed, was that it went against conceptions of the person. It went against um, uh, progressive accounts of how to live your life. And of course, in Bolivia, those alternatives are supplied by indigenous Cosmo visions or, wor or world views. But what's interesting is that the challenge to neoliberalism here is, 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 along, is along ethical rather than, uh, rather than a democratic, a political, economic, or, or some you might say social lines. So that gives you a, just a, a brief taste of, of some of the, uh, some of the, the work we do. And, and again, we have, there are other findings and other implications. Okay, let me switch over to human rights at the crossroads. Um, which is which is another which is another volume which which, which just came out and I'm, I'm this is a volume which I have very high hopes for in the sense for of these range of books that I've been part of I have very high hopes for this book as a uh, it just feels like it's the, again this is not me it's it's I have my own contribution of course but there are other contributions it feels like it really does advance the field and I say this in the area of human rights as someone who I edited a book series uh, on human rights. I've been writing about human rights, as many of you know, teaching about human rights here at SCAR for almost 10 years. God, I can't believe it's been that long. Uh, and so I, the, as the years go by and the experience gets wider, I'm able to sort of survey the field right, and, and, and sort of position this own work. Of course, I'm not just editing, I'm also producing my own, my own work. And what's interesting, and I want to just make a shout out to, to Sarah, uh, who, as you know, we had, a, we had a celebration for her in the spring, so I don't want to duplicate that. But when I came to SCAR, who were then ICAR in 2003, human rights was not a dominant topic uh, for the field. Um, and uh, in fact, I was hired uh, in part to start to bring the, the topic of human rights uh, to, to the field to a certain extent. And I want to uh, just acknowledge Sarah's, Sarah and, and others' vision in, in, in making that happen. And I think 10 years on, I think we can say that human rights has now become a very important topic. Um, some of you might know Ron Fisher, the professor from Con uh, uh, Conflict Resolution from American University. He's produced a diagram of the field. Uh, and I, I'm applying to become a full professor this year, so I'm you know, putting together my materials, right? That'll be an appendix for those full professors. That'll, you'll see that in my portfolio. I'm gonna showcase that. But in his diagram of the field, one of the three core areas, as he sees the field today going forward, is human rights. And that wasn't the case uh, in, in 2003. Now, that's not because of my own work, but I'm a faculty member here, and, this, and I'm working in the area of human rights, and so this is an interesting convergence. But coming back to the book, Human Rights at the Crossroads. So this book takes, starts from the premise that, that we are now 24 years after the end of the Cold War. Yeah? And what's interesting, and I'm sure some, some of you as scholars, as students, and others do the same thing. We get used to talking about the post-Cold War. 
We're in the post-Cold War, the post-Cold that's a big That's a big moment for human rights scholars because at the end of the Cold War, that unleashed a wave of, of human rights activism and institution building which had been pent up since the end of the Second World War and which had been suppressed by a different logic, the logic of the Cold War. So the end of the Cold War is a crucial moment. But in, a question for me is, when does the post-Cold War end? You know? How long do we keep talking about the post-Cold War? Right? And why, why is the post-Cold War important? And here I draw from the work of the anthropologist in, in my contribution here, the anthropologist Victor Turner, who in an important work, which I'm sure you all have by your bedsides, The Forest of Symbols, 1969. I actually do. You do, okay, good. Uh, based on his, his study of Ndembu uh, rites of passage, right? So this is, there's an African society in which uh, every year young men go through a rite of passage. And for a certain period of time, all of the hierarchy in that society is wiped away. The elites, the poor, those who are marginalized, they are all equal for a certain period of time. Right? And that's important because uh, these, what he called periods of liminality are periods of transition. They're periods of the upending of hierarchy, of social status. And of course, what's most important about that, it's a time of possibility. It's a time when conventional wisdom is questioned. And so, and so it's a time of, of possibility and danger. But what's not as well sort of remarked about these, this theory of liminality is that periods of liminality always come to an end, as they always must do. And in another part of Turner, which doesn't get read very often, which I sort of latched onto, he talks about the process of redifferentiation. So after the end of, of liminality, you have new hierarchies emerging, new uh, uh, differentiated um, uh, levels. And so I use that to understand the period of the post-Cold War for human rights, a time of transition, a time of liminality, a time when human rights was becoming important for people and NGOs and activists. But we're arguing in this book that the time, the, 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 the post-Cold War has now come to the end. So my contribution to this, to this book is called Human Rights After Italicize the Post-Cold War. And so we then ruminate on what does it look like in this period of redifferentiation? Re what is the role of human rights for conflict processes and, and so on? And, um, uh, and, and so this book, which is truly interdisciplinary, I'm very proud of this book. I mean, really, you know, we have very, you know, leading legal philosophers, political philosophers, uh, sociologists, anthropologists. I mean, it really is, and it's, it's very difficult, to, as we know it here in the school, it's very difficult to achieve real inter, not, not bring people together from different stripes and colors, but to actually get people to be, you know, talking together in that sort of Frankfurt School, you know, ideal. Uh, and so we take stock, and we again, we draw out, and this is what I'm doing in, in my piece, I'm drawing out what are the lessons, you know, what does a redifferentiated landscape look like? Uh, and so I'm, 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 I'm conscious that I'm, I'm, I've gone on a bit too long, but uh, we have uh, five different uh, markers of this redifferentiated landscape. What is the role of human rights? And so maybe that'll just tantalize you to go and buy the book, you know, or read, or read the book uh, on Amazon um, to see, and it has to do with the idea, the role of the state, practice and politics, pathologies of power, and, and identity, and the role of reproduction in, in, in after the end of the Cold War. So as you can see, I'm very happy to talk about this. Um, it's nice to be here, and again, I hope that uh, piques your interest, and maybe we'll wait till a discussion after Sarah, but... but uh, why don't we do that? We can do that now, just because it's sort of hot. Fine. I mean, I'm I'm happy to take questions. Uh, or uh, Sarah, see Sarah's procrastinating. She doesn't want to come up and. Uh, <laughs> let's do this, Sarah. Let's let's let's. We'll have a conversation. We'll have a, we'll have a kind of because it, it could very well be that there are themes from what you've talked about yeah. which intersect, and we can have a group discussion if that's if that's okay. So so with that, so thank you very much. Um, with that, I want to introduce uh, Sarah Cobb. As many of you know, she was the director of, uh, of ICAR uh, for eight years, um, uh, and again, I, I and, and has contributed to the field in so many different ways. But uh, along the way, and for also for many years, she's been working in the field of narrative and, con and its relation to conflict resolution as a theorist, as a practitioner, as a researcher. And 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 in many ways, her research in narrative is. You know, very literally bringing this uh, this field into being, uh, birthing this field. Uh, she's now the director of the Center for the Study of a Narrative Conflict Resolution, which again is just at, it, at its beginnings, but already dynamic and one of the most the liveliest places here um, in the school. And so, um, this book is her first book, 
but uh, it's not a first book in that traditional sense, right? It's it's a it's a in some ways a kind of magnum opus, a a culmination of, of, of many years, decades of thought, discussion, and so on. And so it's it's a it's a great great pleasure to introduce Sarah. Thank Hoffman. you.